Blitz is defined as a sudden savage attack. It is indeed all this. The effect is sure. The premise is simple. It's a basic primal confrontation, man to man. No excuses are offered. None except. Welcome to the latest edition of Longhorn Blitz with Horns247.com. Looks like a radio station. Now, here are your hosts, lifetime Longhorn Rod Babers. Pure athlete, yeah. I transcend race, hombre. Matt Butler. I don't talk <laughs> man. I back it up. And we are talk full of that, man. Go right. And Jeff Howe. It's still real to me, damn it. <laughs> and that's the bottom line. Because Stone Cold said so. If you're going to blitz, come strong. But don't come at all. Coming strong with another edition of Longhorn Blitz with Orange 24-7. I am Jeff Howe. We had a little moment before we started the show. Uh, Matt was coming to put a mic screen on my mic, and I was looking down at my computer, and all I see is Matt's hand next to my mouth. I was like, hey, Matt, what are you doing? And I was like, oh, he's putting the mic screen on. Get away from my mouth. Yeah. yeah. Like, sure. Normally, you people keep my name out your mouth. It's like, Freak keep your hand out, out my mouth. Keep hand near my mouth. Yeah. Yeah. Never think about that. Another man's hand never like, comes really near your mouth. Within inches. <laughs> But in radio, like you What's probably had people like wander in. Like I know whenever it's like you're live on radio, but people have to bring you things. So like you're sort of in your own head straight away trance while about, all these things true. are going on. I was about to be like, you. Matt, do I need to have the same conversation with you that my wife has with her middle schoolers about boundaries and space <laughs> and let's respect each other's As long as you areas. know what's happening. It's like a haircut, right? Haircut, yes. men get close to you, yeah. so it's cool. Yeah. You know what I mean? But, you know, and uh, if you run another man that close to you, that's all, it's all good. Yes. No, not, there's anything wrong per- with that. If it doesn't matter, male or female, Ralph. There's a hand like close to my mouth. I'm like, hey, wait a minute. Hold on. What, 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 what's going on here? <laughs> yeah, you got to be expecting that. That is yeah, true. Oddly, there's very few professional situations where that's just okay well i get you I get and professional we use that term loosely here on longhorn blitz let me bring in the rest of the team before we get into the meat and potatoes of the show first off the best damn videographer in the podcast game travis crumb over there doing his thing uh he is the master of the soundboard the drop machine extraordinaire matt butler matt uh matt you had some fantasy stuff to take care of i know uh i, I got the chance to uh, go put gas in my car because you're like my lineup's locked at 10 30 so Got some, re- got some research to do. You had a busy did you get morning. It done? You... Did you get it done over there? Yes, sir. I was actually waiting on a, a Longhorn News, Ariel Atkins. But WNBA early morning starts are very bizarre. Well, uh, we'll leave that for another show and another time. There you go. Uh, a man who I'm sure he's done WNBA research at some point because <laughs> – he is a renaissance man, not Probably just here not. on not Longhorn here. Blitz. Okay, well, he's still a renaissance I man. I fed him some. Not just here on Longhorn Blitz, but on the horn where you can catch him each and every day on the broadcast from 1 to 3. Lifetime Longhorn 2002 UT All-American 2002 semifinalist for the Jim Thorpe Award. Fourth-round draft choice of the New York Giants in 2003. Spent his NFL career with the Giants, Lions, Bears, Bucks, Broncos, and a year with the Hamilton Tiger Cats in the CFL. When he was done with football, got himself back to Austin, Texas in the 40 Acres where he earned his degree. Whenever that T-ring comes back in, whenever he goes over and gets it, he will wear it proudly. Nevertheless, he is a card-carrying member of DBU, and when you get that All-American honor, when you're in the record books, you're a black card member. Number 21 in your program, number one in your hearts, Mr. Rod Babers. Thanks for the intro, brother, as always. Before we get into it, uh, no problem, Rod, anytime. I uh, want to remind everybody, thank you guys so much for downloading, listening, however you do it. We thank you so much. Our numbers are continuing to go up, so you guys keep liking us, leaving us reviews, all that fun stuff. However you get it, Stitcher, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, however you get the podcast, thank you so much for continuing to support us here uh, at Longhorn Blitz. Rod, did you see uh, some Twitter video came out? Craig Niver hosted a DBU barbecue over yeah, the weekend. Yeah, I did see uh, the DBU barbecue tweets out there. It's nice, a nice, nice new tradition. I yeah. like that, DBU barbecue. They need, to have, they need to have some of the old heads come back, though. Uh, have, Rod, have Rod uh, Beagle educate. Them. I'm sure. Uh, mm-hmm. I'm sure that you know, uh, Michael, Michael Huff's there. I mean, he's not officially old head, but he's he's an OG. To you know them, I mean? there he's an yeah, old he's head. OG. So yeah. he's there. He's there always there representing. No, no, no. It's good. I'm I'm glad they uh, they're establishing like their own traditions, man. That's good with the new generation of DBU. Yeah, because it seemed like it was. I remember one pro day you were at, and I forget what year it was, but uh, you were there. I don't know if you were working or just watching, but. Coach Aquino was still around, and oh yeah, you know the NFL guys came back, and mm-hmm. you know it was kind of like, hey, yeah. it, it was kind of interesting to see though, like it was like kind of you and Ahmad Brooks, and then it's like, 
Michael Huff and Cedric Griffin, and then it's like the Earl Thomas and Aaron Williams. Oh, yeah, man. Yeah, so it was – It's the generations. You, that's really where I understood to me, and why you watch it from a fan standpoint and, and you see the talent, but like to see it, especially under Coach Kennedy, you're like, okay, this is what DBU, the DBU moniker was all about. Yeah, the handoff from yep. one to another, and that literally – there shouldn't be a drop-off at all. You know what I mean? That should right. pretty, almost be a baseline. And I think, honestly – it has been. It's been pretty consistent. Um, we've had drop offs here and, that, and here been and there, lulls. but little lulls. But hell, man, when you look at what a lot of the guys have done in the league, like it's. I think it's been pretty consistent. Coach Akina did a good job, and obviously Craig Navar and, and Jason Washington are doing a good job right now too. Yeah, those yeah. guys they're recruiting at a high level. They're producing guys at a high level, getting yeah. uh, getting production out of guys yeah. on campus. So. Last week, we talked about Big 12 Media Days. This week, I was at the Texas High School Coaches Association Convention and Rod Stomping Grounds uh, in H-Town. Houston, the good old George R. Brown Convention Center. And got oh, to is hear- that where it was? Yeah. Interesting. Over okay. thir- 13,000 coaches showed up to that deal, Rod. So it's, wow. it's a massive yeah, deal. Massive deal every summer. Huge, yeah. And uh, got to hear from Tom Herman. Now, I heard plenty from Tom Herman at Big 12 Media Days, but Tom Herman was part of the – Division one coaches panel, so he got to get up there and you know give his spiel. Basically, they take a few questions, but really it's all twelve division one coaches and Craig Way, who Craig's emceed that thing for however long they've been doing fifteen years, however long they've been doing it. Yeah, Craig said this is the first time he can remember, and this is the first year I've actually gone to the panel. I've always wanted to go, mm-hmm. haven't gone, but went this year. Craig said this is the first time he can remember that all twelve division one coaches, every division one program in the state, had their head coach there. So you're talking oh, wow. every, really? everybody from the top, from Tom Herman, Jimbo Fisher, Matt Rule, Gary Patterson, Interesting. all the way That's down. That's never to, happened before? That's a good point. Because Craig said like there were so years weird. where like, Mike Leach didn't go. It and would make sense that whoever the, Mike Leach, wouldn't go. Whoever the UTEP coach was wouldn't go, or guys have different wow. obligations, whether it's a media day or so whatever, strange. that they can't go. But, yeah, huh. he said all, all 12 were there. And basically they just give each of them a chance to, hey, kind of promote your program. What's special about Texas or Texas State or UTSA or North Texas or whatever? Yeah. So Tom Herman got to, you know, gave his speech and talked about just Texas being the total package. But the interesting thing for me was. <laughs> there you go. Texas being the total package. Norco. Uh, I'm sure, Lex, Nor- I'm Lex sure Norco would appreciate that. <laughs> uh, but the interesting thing for me, Rod, was when it was press conference time because all head coaches do a press conference while they're there. Yeah. Or they're supposed to anyway. Tom Herman had other obligations, so he sent Stan Drayton and Todd Orlando, which, as a media core in Austin, I don't think we've talked to Stan Drayton since the initial staff was introduced. And we've talked to Todd Orlando once before the Sugar Bowl and once during spring football, but that's it. So, And I got uh, somewhere around five to ten minutes by myself in the hallway with Todd Orlando just to chop it up for a little bit and talk about – and I'll have some of that stuff on the website just talking about how he used, you know, snap numbers and things like that. And yeah. a lot of B.J. Foster talk he and I got into and some big nickel stuff. So, yeah, um, looking forward to getting into that. But before we dive into that, so that's kind of what the bulk of this week's show is going to be about is about Todd Orlando and Stan Drayton. But, Rod, anything from Big 12 Media Days we didn't get into last week? that you want to get into this week? Anything we missed? Anything on your mind? No, Matt, I don't same think for you. so. Um, not that I can – not that I can remember that we didn't talk about that was one of the major subjects. I think yeah, we got not from it. media days, but just like the image you put in my mind, I was still laughing of Mike Leach at a coaching convention. Like that would be the one of the most funny. <laughs> I like the, the one I miss guy Mike I, Leach at Big Twelve Media Days. Exactly. That, that's a subject. Yeah, that would be <laughs> funny. <laughs> um, but no, I, I think we covered everything. Um, uh, one of the things that, yeah, I mean, I, I think that for the most part we got into it. I don't want to dive back into some old stuff. I know we got new stuff. No, one thing I did want to bring up because it came up this week because he wound up on the uh, on the Outland Trophy watch list. And watch, look, watch lists, you take them for what they're worth. Right? Yeah, I mean, they are everybody. If you are a if you if you are a legitimate NFL prospect, usually you end up on the watch list or if you've had a reasonably good year at that position, you end up on a watch list. I would go Sometimes there's like 100 guys on a watch list. I would go a step further, of a proven good college Yeah, player. you know what if I mean? It's a, like you're a proven product. A pro- yeah. I was going to say, if you're a proven, proven commodity, commodity at the college yeah. level, your position, you should be on a watch list. Yeah, there you go. Probably. You know what I mean? Opportunity and you've yeah. played well. But the Outland Trophy watch list comes out, and Parker Braun's on the Outland Trophy watch list, and I think that shows the respect nationally because that's something the Football Writers Association does. They do the Outland Trophy and mm-hmm. uh, the the uh, Bronco Nagurski Trophy 
which I get to make nominations for that. Is I mean, if you're a member of the Football Writers Association, you get to do that. Do we have someone on the Nagurski watch list? Is that Brandon Jones? Who's on the Nagurski watch list? Uh, Brandon Jones and Caden Stearns. Caden, okay, Brandon Jones. Both and those guys. Okay, yeah. But Zach Shackelford Parker Braun ended up on the Outland Trophy watch list, and it just shows the respect nationally, Rod, that people have for Parker Braun based on what he did at Georgia Tech. Mm-hmm. But I'm just thinking about this offensive line, and yeah, there are question marks, but not the kind of question marks we've had about that group in years past. Like in years past, and some years it's been, okay, can you find five competent guys that can fill out your starting lineup? Yeah. Now it's more hope. of if Sam Cosme can make the transition from right tackle to left tackle. And it, and, and Tom Herman hit on this at Big 12 Media Days. This is what I was getting at. Basically said there's going to be two things that determine whether Parker Braun – you know, red shirts and comes back for another year, or whether he is in there as one of your best five, how quickly can he pick up kind of just the, the general nuances and, and competing and the general nuances of Herb Hand's scheme and competing with the other guys he's got to beat out? Yeah. And two, how quickly can he pick up playing in a spread offense? And, so, and, and one of the yeah. quotes Tom Herman had at Big 12 Media Days is like, I don't know if there's a Rosetta Stone for spread offense, but going from the triple option at Georgia Tech to basically an NFL offense. It's like night and day. But, Rod, if he's able to do that, and, and look, go find, pull up clips of him at, at Georgia Tech, whether he's going against Clemson or whoever in that league, there's a reason he's a two-time first-team all-conference guy in that in that league. If he hits at left guard and the Cosme thing moving him to left tackle works out, and I think at this point you know what you're going to get from Shackelford if he's healthy, that's three-fifths of your offensive line, Rod, that are probably better than just about anybody else in the conference is going to have. Yeah. No, and I think um... – He'll be fine because he's he's bookended by Cosby on one end, who is uh, I think uh, he not only is one of the best run blockers in the Big Twelve coming back and returning, but also I think his athleticism he can excel as a as a pass blocker too. I think he is gonna I think he's gonna be fantastic at left tackle. I, don't, I really don't worry about Sam Cosby. Yeah, from what I've watched, I think the transition will be easy and seamless for him. Zach Shackelford is I mean that's your senior. That's the guy that's has you know who, who's been there and kind of seen everything, it, having those two guys, uh, one who has a really high ceiling as a as a left tackle athletically and who has kind of that the ideal skill set for left tackle, and another guy who's got a, a ton of experience on the O line. I don't worry about Parker Braun fitting right in. I know he can run block too. All the, all he all he's going to struggle with potentially is you know picking up uh you know picking up some of the the, the splitses and like some of the you know some of the stunts and some of the, the games that the defensive linemen try to run with different linebackers and safeties and DBs in the Big 12 as opposed to what he saw in the ACC. Uh, but I'm assuming, you know, he probably saw some of that too, and maybe not as much because they didn't pass the ball at all. Yeah, so I don't know how much, you know, run blitzes he faced. But ever- and working with his new line with teammates yeah. when the idea that you're facing multiple blitzes, mm-hmm. it isn't necessarily to exploit one lineman, it's to exploit the line. And if you're not only coming in and tr- with new teammates where you might not have that chemistry or continuity because you are working as a unit, but then the change in what you did there to what you're learning now, just a lot. Some players, you know, you got high football IQ, it clicks, it goes quick. Yeah. Some players, it takes time to learn. So, like, that sort of the one thing when you look at that that's the only area you can point at where there might be a deficiency there but if you fix yeah. it up quick you'll be able to tell pretty quick too and rod you know i mean from being around a game offensive line it's just about you know your your blocking rules change it's just about understanding the scheme and and the verbiage might be different but and i know look it's it's, it's going to be different going from a triple option to going to this offense no doubt. but no doubt. you know a zone step is a zone step and a pull step is a pull step and, and stuff like that. So from that, like, I don't worry about him learning, like, just the nuances of line play. No, it's be able just to a different culture. Can he yeah, just and, and, and learn. Know, culture and, of, it's a different culture of football. Right, and learning calls yeah. and just how Herb yeah. Hand does things. It's just it, it, it might take him a little bit. But I, what Tom Herman's saying team. about Parker Braun is really no different than what he said about Calvin Anderson. I mean, he said last year. Look, Calvin Anderson's going to have to earn his spot. He's not just going to be given a spot. Yeah. And he did, but I think we found out that, yes, Calvin Anderson was one of the best five offensive linemen that you had last year. And I don't – look, the red shirt thing has been dangled out there, I think, Rod, as you For say, if, 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 if fit hits mm. the shan and it just nah, does not work out. I can't see just it. But, but – I don't see it. But see it. you guys know as well as anybody, and anybody listening to this podcast knows – you're taking a graduate transfer because you feel they can come yeah, in and play I, right now. That's uh, I don't see the red shirt thing happening. The truth is, he's 
he is, I think right now, just projecting, he's one of your best five offensive linemen, one of your best five or six guys. You're going to potentially try to find I'd say seven to eight offensive linemen that you trust. I think the best way to do it, and I've said it before, take Kerstetter out of the mix and just try to find the best five outside of Kerstetter. And then wherever you're weakest on that O-line, mm-hmm. and I don't think it'll be on that left side because I think Parker Brown will fit right in. And I know some people say he's undersized, but he's in the Big 12. There so you go. Unfortunately, you're you being D-line undersized. You're not that line. big a deal. Yeah, you already you already uh, you, you know you already met that challenge in the ACC. Not a Clemson, you, right? Like, if you could de- if you could deal with the the girth and the bulk and the power of the of the ACC, then you could deal with that same thing at, in in the at the Big Twelve level. Right. Um, and if I think the athleticism will be tested, his athleticism because I think he'll face faster D linemen, quicker. Uh, you know, more explosive D linemen. And hell, even so at the combine, the Big 12 didn't have a lot of D linemen there, but the few they had there were really explosive and they were fast. And a lot of the defensive linemen this year were really athletic and explosive talents. So Parker Braun has already proved that he can meet that type of talent with elite linemen. Calvin Anderson's challenge was different. He was playing at Rice, uh, you know, as kind of a subpar level of football compared mm-hmm. to. Power Five football. So his his challenge was: Can he play at this elite level? Can he uplift his play consistently to have a baseline of success from down to down versus Power Five competition? He proved, yeah, he could do that. He no was question at about his it. Ceiling when he came here. That's yeah, no different I, than Brian, so who isn't at his ceiling. I think Parker. That's a great point. I think Parker Brian is will, Learned, will show exactly. that once he can, you know, once he can adjust to the passing culture and be a guy that can pass yeah. block. And I think he'll get a lot of help because I said he's bookended. I think he'll he'll prove to be an asset on that O line. That mm-hmm. left side I think is going to be the strength of that O line and one of the strengths of the running game too because all those guys are great run blockers. Without the pass blocking thing, even Cosby on the left side, we still don't know as a left tackle if he's going to be the anchor and can be the anchor. We are, you know, everything projects the skill set, the the you know the the tools, everything projects. All right, the phys- the physical tools, but we still don't know. We're just projecting him to be be that guy yeah. that can make that transition. Same thing with Parker Brun. He just projects as a guy that can you know obviously be the starting left guard. But we know both of those guys can run block. Usually the easiest thing for an offensive lineman to do is to be able to run block. Most of them will tell you they'd rather run block than pass block. Put Casey hand, Stutter will tell you that all day every fire day. Fire off and yeah. knock somebody backwards. And that's what Parker Brown was doing. He's an echo of the whistle guy. He's going to get into some – you're going to see him get into scuffles with guys. Mm-hmm. I mean, when you watch the film on him, he gets into it with guys all the time. That's kind of what he does. Plays with a chip on his shoulder. And, yeah, he does remind you of your – Kind of stereotypical offensive lineman, the guy mm-hmm. that just is nasty and wants uh, you to know run I mean? block. Yeah, and he want well, he wants to run block till the whistle blows and even after. And he wants he's to a pan- millennial stuttered. Yeah, and he wants to pancake <laughs> his guy on every play. Like that's his goal. He's trying to pancake his guy and humiliate his guy on every play. And yep. when you talk about a guy like him, I mean, it sounds like basically in the worst case scenario for Texas fans, you got a guy already with a very valuable tool being that he's a good run blocker. And you know that Texas right now already has one of the best goal line and short yardage yeah. situations before that. And we've seen the use of d- jumbo packages or the ability to use an athletic body like that if you need it. So worst case scenario, you already have that that can provide depth or be a guy that's maybe you know deficient in one area on the line but if it actually turns into an all-around lineman then you got a guy that's a plus run guy and then you can add on whatever it is that he gives you in the passing game yeah i tend to think pass blocking is more of if you've got the athleticism and the Mm -hmm. the bend and the physical ability to do it it's all some footwork and yeah Making sure your pad level is right, and you know, I'm not, sure not going to sit here. And, I'm right not going to sit here and make pass block techniques sound like quantum no. physics. No, know? I'm sure it's not. But it, it, like I said, it helps for him to have two guys uh, on both sides. It's of just the one thing he experience. hadn't done, so you don't know yet. But don't it's know. easiest to have. You don't. It's hard to make a guy become a good run blocker if he doesn't have that in him to be that aggressive. Maul or, Maul, exactly. Yeah. So it works well. So when you talk about the offensive line, you talk about the running game and which takes us to running back, so which takes us to Stan Drayton and what he had to say at the coaches' convention. And, yes, before anybody asks, I did in the hallway one-on-one ask Stan Drayton about recruiting. He did tell me point blank, yes, by the end of the 2020 recruiting cycle, they will get a running back that they really like. It is a difference maker. So Stan Drayton went on record saying they'll, he called get, his shot? they'll get it done. He hmm. said they'll get he it done. He called his shot? It's called the shot. Well, you can only because you know recruiting rules. You can you got to be kind no, of. No, I know vague, you can't. But I'm just saying. Yeah, he, for us, he's he said at home or he's not pointing. Interpreting, yeah, he called it shot. He didn't say like imply that they're gonna go get you know 
No. Yes, they're going to get Zach Evans. But yeah, no, he but said is they're going to get a, a, a game changer. They'll, okay. get, they'll get a running back that can be a really productive player in the system. Hmm. But what I thought was real interesting about what he said, Rod, the talk really wasn't about Keontae Ingram. The talk was about Jordan Whittington. And the guy Stan Drayton compared him to, and he was talking about you know guys that make the transition quickly to the college level that his true freshmen are pretty much ready to go right out of the gate. And Stan Drayton said he's only been one other freshman that's done that the way Jordan Whittington has. And we're all kind of assuming, all right, he's talking about Zeke Elliott, obviously, from Ohio State. No, Stan Drayton went back to his Villanova days and was talking about Brian Westbrook, that's who awesome. was – Really good in nice. the NFL yeah, for a really long time. Andy and Reed ahead system. of his time. Yeah. In that he, Andy he was Reed like system. one of the first yeah. guys that was truly used. Like, it wasn't a guy like, say, how you saw Larry Sanders catch a lot of balls as a running back. It was a guy that the entire offense sort of was primarily focused around a guy being a dual threat at running back. Brian Westbrook did cost me a fantasy football championship one Him year, but that's drama around. for another day. Yeah. Yes, thank you, Matt, for bringing that memory up. That was the play I was thinking about. But – uh no, Rod, when you look at this Jordan Whittington skill set, and I want you to expand on this because you, you bring this up, and I love it, man. I, is it the 40-30 club, the 30-40 club? The 30-40 club. Like, he's got that kind of skill set. If you're comparing mm-hmm. him to a Brian, uh, a Brian Westbrook, and we mm-hmm. know they initially recruited him to be in that H receiver position, like, I, I think the way it's shaking out, and we'll get to Danny Young and, and Kirk Johnson in a minute, but the way it's shaking out is we know Keontae Ingram is going to be the feature back, but Jordan Whittington, yes, he is a running back, but – they're going to use him in a multitude of ways to try to get him the football. Yeah, um, it's uh, yeah, it's really interesting when you look at because I think I read he came in at two hundred pounds and now he's at two fifteen, two twenty. Yeah, so he's put on twenty pounds already. <laughs> already, but he looked of, he of looked even even and, from the end of his senior year when he was at like the the All Star the All American Bowl and state championships. Even look at him from then till the spring game, you could see a difference. No, his body looks is mm-hmm. different, and obviously, if you're putting on 20 pounds of muscle with Yancey McKnight, uh, that's what I like for both of those running backs. Both of them have added that much. Uh, I think they call it body armor, but they've mm-hmm. added you know Herman the bulk yeah. just so you can take on you know the hits and uh, you can be able to kind of take on more of the load. But getting back to Jordan Whittington, his skill set is so unique because I I think he can be um, you know kind of what. Eric Metcalf should have always been and <laughs> for Texas and what guys like Alvin Kamara potentially are with the New Orleans Saints. Mm-hmm. I mean, he can do that. I know Jake Smith also can fill that role, but Jordan Whittington, because he can play almost any position, you line him up in a slot, and he's a natural receiver. I mean, that's where people say he's probably most dangerous. You can motion him out. He makes your offense multiple. Hmm. Just having him on the field makes you multiple. Yeah. So you can go from having, you know, you can go from, you know, twenty personnel to, uh, you know, to eleven personnel. All right, to to basically, you know, to you can go from having two backs in the backfield to, and I, I would love to see, and I, I think they've done it before, the shotgun split back with Jordan Whittington and Keontae Ingram in the backfield and three wide receivers. Out there, and your three wide outs are Colin Johnson, Devin Duvernay, and Jake Smith, Josh Moore, just Josh pick, Moore, whoever, one, whoever you want to, yeah, whoever you want to throw in there. And I know it's having that, having you know that option, you could either motion those guys out and make a four wide package where you have two by two, or you could have trips or whatever, or you could have one of those guys as a lead blocker and end up running, you know, zone read or RPOs. I mean, you can get really crazy and creative when you got a guy on the field like that. And I know that's what Tom Herman wants. And you envision like Percy Harvin, the way he was used exactly. with Urban Meyer. Um, even with when they were up at Ohio State, they had guys like, you know, Jalen Marshall and um, Curtis Samuels, they had those guys who were multiple in their skill set, and therefore they made the offense multiple. And I think Texas at one point is going to have two or three of those guys to choose from. Last year they had both of their running backs, Trey Watson mm-hmm. and Keontae Ingram, had at least 20 receptions. We know Tom Herman and we and Tim Beck, they like to use their running backs in the passing game. Mm-hmm. The last time Texas had at least two running backs with 20 receptions was 2001. That's crazy. You got to go all the way back. To 2001. 
was the last one. Was that time. a bad word of band? It was like Ivan Williams yeah, and, and Victor like, Wright, maybe. maybe? If, yeah, I, the technicality yeah, I forget. If, <laughs> if Ray Mon- Ramones was, didn't get 20 or was a wide receiver in 05, you know, like those type of No, ideas. I don't think he ever got that. Yeah, so no that, matter that what you say, they did. Crazy. And, they, and Ramones, they, they, never, they, never, they never really had to do that. Remember, Tony Jeffrey was like the leading receiver in 04. They didn't give a damn about throwing the ball. <laughs> I mean, it's like well, a, you still have both Skafe and David Thomas, too. You had both. Yeah, yeah exactly. I'm talking about running. I'm talking about actual the running backs. Yeah, Two yeah, guys okay. who were running. Running backs listed as running mm-hmm. backs. Yeah, yeah. Caught at least twenty passes. You got to go all the way back, man, like two thousand one. So that that in itself was a bit of a you know a landmark, and Longhorn fans don't really you know care about it. But it shows you that he's gradually getting the running backs more and more involved in the passing game. Hell, you could have you could have two guys enter the thirty forty club next year. Mm-hmm. I mean this this coming up season, you could have Keontae Ingram in it. Easily, and I could see easily Jordan Whittington in it. Guys who had at least 30 rushes and 40 receptions in a season. Last time it happened was 2008 with Chris Obadiah. Uh, before that, you got to go back to 1988 with Eric Metcalf. Only 12 to 15 guys in all of the FBS it actually end up in that 30 40 club every year. And I think Texas could end up with two of those guys. They're definitely going to have one this year. Yeah, that'd and I be think huge. it's going to be Jordan Whittington. Yeah, yeah, well, and then Keontae Ingram's the type of guy that when you look, I at I think his he could number, do it too. No, he should be able to when you look at just the amount of targets that go around normally to the Tom Herman backs, and even like last year when you almost had Watson and him right there with those numbers. And when you're talking about the comparisons, it sort of just popped in my head right now. And it was the guy that went under the radar in college, but blew up on the scene in the NFL. But Philip Lindsay, the type of guy that it reminds oh, yeah. me of Whittington a lot because he has that elite top end speed, but a guy. That that seems to be a smaller body type, which in the past would keep you from being a guy that can be a lead back or a main back. But then you actually realize these guys are durable enough. They can withstand this at that level. And they're so certain players never get hit that hard because they are so just good at getting out into space and winning those battles. So just a guy like that, that can be uh, uh, the reason I brought up Ramonts earlier is because Whittington's skill set reminds me of him because he was a guy that you didn't have to compartmentalize as a running back or as a receiver that he was sort of a chess piece that we could always turn around and put into something. We just had so much talent then that you didn't need to. And that's where the good situation being a true freshman like Whittington is coming in. There isn't a set B like there was whenever Ramonts was coming in. Like Whittington gets the opportunity as a young player to go out immediately. And especially if Ingram is ever down with injuries or anything like that. But if that's a two-headed monster, that's exactly what you want in the big 12. Yeah, Rod, if you're just looking at uh, school records for receptions by a running back, Keonta Ingram last year with 27 catches, he's already in the top 10. That's mm. crazy. Already single, in the top single 10 season, that single season? Single season receptions. That wow. 27 yeah, last 27 year. 27 was a lot put, more. Put yeah. him in the top 10. Yeah. Yeah. Um, That's what Vermont's God, had in 05. Just, just looking at this, man. It, it just, oh, is that what Vermont said? There you go. Just looking at this. Well, and Vermont was a receiver for part of that year, too. Yeah. So but he, he, was, kinda, he, was, he was. But that, he's that guy. He's that, like, that, that's he what I'm talking about. He's that guy. He's 76 carries, 27 Yeah, he is He is what you envision Jordan Whittington to be. That might be the best. A bigger version Where Reggie Bush ended up being. Vermont's Taylor, though, might be the best comparison for what you know jordan woodington in terms of skill set and impact probably i think that, just a bigger for, for term, in terms of texas guys guys that texas had because i mean even yeah. you think about a guy like we all talked about Dejay johnson it seems like for years yeah. maybe being that guy but like that's one of those guys rod that this program has like tried to find that guy look like, okay can you find somebody like ramont's taylor like with that kind of skill mm-hmm. set and whether it was dj monroe or marquise DJ goodwin johnson. or DJ johnson it just hadn't worked out for one reason or another with all through all those guys, but it seems like now you've got the the skill set with Jordan Whittington and man, just looking at these receiving numbers by running backs in school history, just in terms of single season, God, Eric Metcalf was way ahead of his time. What what yeah. what do you have? Well, he's in he's three of the top ten most prolific reception seasons by a running back in yep. school history. Eric Metcalf's got three of them. Yeah. Yeah, 40, and he was 42, a great kick return, 42 catches in 88, 42 catches in 86, and then 33 in 87. Yeah. And then I mean, there you go. That, he's the guy. Yeah. So, 
I was watching, uh, it was on last night on LHN too, and just this conversation about this receiving back sort of made, triggered the thought that I was like thinking what we learned from running backs because it went straight from we had maybe argue, arguably the best running back in the history of college football, and it was Ricky Williams, and he can take on anything and do anything. But you look at the production and what came, you lose that, you replace it, you think with somebody like Hodges Mitchell can't be a guy that's can be the you know guy that's a front runner for an offense and be that lead back. But he's a dude that catches the ball and does all these little things well enough that you can still have a top end, very good offense with a guy like Hodges because the devalued nature of the running back. It was in real time when we were watching it, it's like, well, you're never going to replace Ricky Williams. And Hodges Mitchell is just this niche tool, but Hodges was a quick enough guy to hit the hole, a guy that could catch a ball out of the backfield. And then you look at the offense between Ricky and between Benson, you didn't have much of a fall off because it was sort of Texas in front of our own. And I is seeing that you can have a lesser player at running back and still be satisfactory. But if you get a Ramon, a Whittington, or a top end guy like a Deontay or a Ricky, you can be, you know, focus your offense around those well, type of guys. I, th- I think there's another way to look at that too, Matt. I think if you take Hodges Mitchell mm-hmm. and let's say you were able, Rod, to pair him with a guy like Cedric Benson, then I think the perception of what Hodges Mitchell is and how he's used completely changes. Agreed. Yep. He becomes uh, kind of what Darren Sproles was. You try to exactly. use him in that role. That's what I was talking about piece. watching the ninety. I was yeah. watching the ninety nine Texas OU game, and it was a shootout. You sacked Josh Heupel. It's back and forth. There was ninety five passes. It was forty eight for Heupel, forty seven for Major. It was a game ahead of its time. It was yeah. Mike Leach and them, and it was just me watching it. And they, you could hear the announcers. One of them said that he would actually literally give away. They asked him, "What would you give to be in a game where you could have ninety five combined pass?" by both teams and he's like ah my two german shepherds in my boat it was like it was absurd but like it was a foreign game they were watching they couldn't yeah, yeah. believe it and it's because of these head of their time offenses that Rod, were in the big Rod 12 wearing that reebok jersey looked about three yeah. sizes too big reebok jerseys yeah terrible they were not uh, not form fitting even the, the Nike shoes stuff were, was. even the, the cleats they, were bad so much no, more no, no offense to reebok it, it made was, the pads oh, yeah. look bigger it looked it was bad yeah anyway sorry but no uh, but that's the difference between like a guy like hodges mitchell and a guy like ramon's taylor who when you yeah, put him in a backfield in. with Jamal Charles and mm-hmm. with a running quarterback like Vince Young and his first year with Cedric Benson. Yeah. You're you're all you're asking him to do is hey, just go be you. We don't no, need we don't need you. The interesting thing about guy. all these guys that you bring up, the DJ Johnsons, the um, you know, the uh the DJ Monroe's I'll uh, throw Marquis Goodwin. You know what in I mean? There. And you know, I, I wouldn't put Marquise Goodwin in there because Marquise Goodwin was a wide, wide receiver. receiver, and we knew what he was. Yeah, he, but he, 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 we we all agree he should have been. We knew used. exactly what he was. These other guys, there is a challenge when you bring yeah. them. When you bring in Ramon's Taylors yeah. of the world, and you have these different, you know, and honestly, Jamal Charles probably could have been in there. Jamal yeah. Charles was, and, and Jamal Charles mm-hmm. is probably the best example of the guys who were underutilized here at Texas. Look and how that's kind of the point used them the next year throwing yeah. to Jamal out of the and, backfield in 06. And 07. Yeah, you and, saw I know they were, and I know they were great, right. but they were still underutilized. Yes. Yeah. We found out later like at what, of, what, what Jamal Charles could have been with Kansas City. We went, oh, yeah, they probably should have used him a little bit, uh, a little From bit day more. From day one, he led the NFL diverse, in, yards for in my ever. diverse ways here at Texas. Yeah. Same thing with DJ Johnson. Same thing with DJ Monroe. Same, and Ramon Taylor, hell, even Ramon Taylor was awesome. It, it's probably as close as we came to maximizing one of those guys. Guys was probably just never Taylor. we never found out with RT just, where yeah, the ceiling was exactly and he was just on circle. the cusp of it too and and you keep going those names so that's the unfortunate part is when the uh, the offensive identity crisis happened Texas was getting all these guys and yet they couldn't maximize and the beauty of what Tom Herman's gonna do with Jordan Whittington's and the Jake Smiths of the world you know what I mean just like he did with little Jordan Humphrey he's gonna say all right what what does this guy do best and how do they best fit into my offense, and how can I mold it to maximize them? And I got full trust he's going to do that. And, you know, we've never seen anything like Jordan Whittington. The truth is he's a mix between Ramon Taylor and Eric Metcalf. He's somewhere mm-hmm. in between. And how is he going to use him? I don't know, but I'm sure it's going to be – it's going to be in a myriad of ways, yeah, like I mean, a ton a, of different ways. It's a hard, it's a hard comp, and you know, I filled in on, on the morning. It is a hard comp. I filled in on the morning show on Wednesday I mean, there on B and E. I filled in, for, I filled in for Bucky because they were trying to figure out, okay, well, who does Patrick Mahomes remind you of? And I said, really, I mean, when you've got a player that unique, I said, you almost have to take with him. So you almost have to take like the best of what Randall Cunningham was, mm-hmm. and the best of what Steve Young was, <laughs> and maybe you combine them together. <laughs> 
Harry, and Aaron with that, Rogers you get Patrick Mahomes. Yeah. It's like you know, Favre's but, arm on Aaron Rodgers' Right, but legs. that's the deal. Yeah. Like, that's basically what you're saying, Rod, is with a guy like Whittington. And people are like, well, you, and it's like, well, what's, yeah. what's a comp for Jake Smith? Is it Christian McCaffrey? And I don't know, because I see some Christian McCaffrey. I see some Randall Cobb in his game. Like Alvin Kamara in his they're, game. They're mm-hmm. so... Those two guys are so unique and, and so dynamic. Like you said, just by having them on the field, you make them multiple. But I have trust in Tom Herman to use those guys right, as you said, to where unlike – like, and, and I know it wasn't all Brian Harson's fault because, Rod, we know behind the scenes just what a mess things were mm-hmm. at Texas at the time. But don't tell me you can't get Marquise Goodwin the ball in a certain situation because it's not on the right hash mark. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like you got a guy who's a freaking Olympic long jumper and like has world-class speeds, a fast, probably might be the fastest man in the world. Get him the damn ball. Yeah. Figure and, it out. Yeah. And, and that's what you're getting paid for. That's what you were making the comp was well, how guys that were underutilized. And he he's he's also, you can argue, one of the greatest examples of a guy that was underutilized. I think here in the Texas. greatest, in my opinion. He could be. I mean, it turns out he's the fastest man in the mm-hmm. NFL right now. Him and Tyreek Hill could battle it out potentially yeah. for the fastest man. But right Another now my money's found. my money's on Marquise. And yet here at Texas, I used to always I remember you know, saying it I probably on this damn podcast if we had like they should just throw him the damn ball all yep. the time and just deep. throw it deep to him. He should have six to eight deep shots every Shano game. Does it. And Shano <laughs> doesn't. Because like, well, what are you gonna do? Your George corner, him. your corner can't run with him. We know this. this oh is, yeah, this he is the, ended your Sherman corner cannot there run with like, him. So what do your corner need? He needs safety help. So the safety is automatically, even if he start, if he sees him, if he sees Marquise starting to book it, yeah. that safety goes, holy Chicago, yes. I'm going right over the top of this guy. And you've automatically removed two guys from the equation if you've ever of the numbers game. Earl Thomas it's, go up against Marquise Goodwin because he knows oh man, this. He already He's knows. a different player. He isn't as effective because of what Marquise does there. It's no, insane. no safety is. No, it, it's if great. And even the like, best one in the world isn't. Because I'm a corner and I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna cuss my safety out yeah. if I get burned deep. Like, do you know I couldn't run with him? I told you that <laughs> field session. I can't run with it's him. It's on you. Uh, it's on you. If what if once he goes, I can't do anything about it. Like, I gotta try my best. He's not human. He's an X Man, and I alien. can't do anything about that. So he's he's an alien. And for Texas to not have that dude streaking down the field, I don't know, three times a quarter and just chunking it, it's a that was just sad. Yeah, and to go sad. full circle on our last point right before that because it just while Jeff was, was talking how you know the first running back. Can I make a point real quick, this? Matt? Just yeah. how absurd this is. Yeah. It's sad. You, you you want to take a wild guess how many games in his career it took Marquise Goodwin to get a hundred yard receiving game? Oh, dude, it was how many games into his career? He probably didn't even get. Like, well, he I don't know how many game starts winning. he had either into that. Well, as a this, freshman, he was doing it because he cut the TD against but OU starts, but didn't probably have enough starts yards. Starts be damned. Like, this is a guy that should be getting the ball. I agree. Probably till 2011. 32 games. Yeah, 2011. Yeah. The regular season finale in 2011 against Baylor. He had five for 129. Because what do they start doing? Oh, they just send him on a nine and just. That case, just throw it in this general area. Why do you have him running other routes? He should be running running nines and posts and hitch and goes (laughs) and uh, out and ups. Like, everything should be just him like opening up down the field and freaking out the defense. Like I said with Devin You know what I'm throwing underneath? A drag route. Mm. <laughs> a wide open drag to somebody coming in. I mean, it was. It's like I said with Devin Duvernay <laughs> or Colin Johnson. Like that route tree doesn't need to have a lot of branches on it. I, I didn't understand it, man. But, yeah, you know, Deontay Foreman back. didn't start a game until his breakout season, and it, it took him forever to see that. It, it, it Some of the things are just flabbergasted. I'm flabbergasted by looking looking back in retrospect like, what the hell were they doing? I at least loved in 09, though, wow. like, if you want to look. Nick Saban uh, said he was scared of DJ Monroe. Yeah. And they wouldn't give him the ball. <laughs> Nick, Nick Saban. He said, I'm, I'm scared of that dude. He, he didn't even say he said He just mentioned his number, I think. Well, 20. 28, 20. Those are the two guys, 26 and 84. It's like, those guys scare you. Yeah. To borrow, borrow some parlance from Mac Brown. It scares you to death. If you watch back to that 09 Texas OU game when Marquise is a freshman and he catches that touchdown to give us the lead, and it was like literally the first half you could tell it was a situation where the freshman like wasn't getting as many opportunities, but something changed because Colt was only looking for Marquise on the quick slant. On the, like the second half, Colt, no. that's what you're doing. And like there was one time it worked perfectly early in the game, and then that entire second half you have him on the field, and at that point, 
point he was sort of solidified as that guy as a freshman. But then you lose Colt, and it's him just in a barren offensive wasteland for the last back, few years. Back when Damn. Oklahoma actually played defense, Rod. Damn. There was a time. <laughs> a little bit. There, there, there was a time. When Texas OU. Uh, yeah. before, before we move on to defense, because I want to get to some of this Todd Orlando stuff, which was really good. We talk about the offense. I, I think this is a good Orlando. point to make. We talk about running back recruiting, and I talked about it with Stan Drayton very little, but I did want to make sure I got to make sure I get a running back recruiting question in there. But we talked about uh, he was talking about the the run game, and and basically like the running backs, the running backs taking it kind of as a personal challenge to you know to to be more to be more heavily featured in the offense because Sam Ellinger does run the ball a lot and. Tom Herman said, you know, they're not going to stop running the quarterback because why would you when you've got Sam Ellinger? And Stan Drayton even said he's like, we would have to be the dumbest coaching staff in America to not run the quarterback with considering the guy you have behind center. No doubt. Yeah. And it brings me to this point, Rod, and this is kind of more ventures into the recruiting area. We'll have we'll have our conversation with Mike Roach coming up here in a little bit. But when you talk about, okay, do you need to feature the backs more to, you know, Make sure that appeals more to recruits or whatever. You know what Tom Herman's number one objective is? Win, win, win freaking win. games. That's, win that's game. what appeals. Yeah. You know, and if you've got to combat that, if you're being negatively recruited against because the running the quarterback runs the ball a lot, okay. As a as an assistant coach, that's what you get paid to do. No, is right. to go win recruiting battles. You are right. He okay. His number one job is to win, no question. Uh, but how he does that? Because Longhorn fans are such intelligent. Sports fans and football fans, and they are. They are. They know their football. Now they may be uh, blinded by burnt orange passion, yeah, and irrational, but they know their football. They know ball yeah. now. All right. And here's the thing about uh, the running game for Texas. I believe it's going to break down into big games, and those are the Bam Bam Sam I'm games. With you 100%. And then there are the other games where that's where we're going to need Keontae Ingram and Jordan Whittington to be showcased, featured, and they carry this offense. All right. Um, because we don't want you can't endanger Sam Ellinger that much. You can't put him in that much at that much risk. That's why you look at the games last year where Texas ran Sam the most. The biggest game of the year was Georgia. They ran him 21 times. All right, versus Oklahoma, I think they ran him 19 times and like uh, maybe like 15 times. And that against USC, they ran him around 17 times. Those are the four biggest games of the year. OU twice, Georgia. Uh, USC, mm-hmm. and that's when Tom Herman. That's when he decides. Okay, I'm letting. And you know what, Sam already he missed two games during the year. So even it's not with, a necessity yeah, for success, it's, you're it's, doing it that way. Exactly, because you need Sam to win all those games. Yes, winning number one. Like that, you in the can't playoffs. win without exactly. You can't win without Sam. But when you go up against Georgia and Oklahoma and USC, mm-hmm. where those are the biggest games of the year, so you're going all in. Your chips are going all in. That's when you go. All right, I got to risk Sam. I'm He's going bam, bam, Sam. Tool. He's my best chance to win when I unleash him because the, he is the cheat code and defenses can't. There's no way to defend a quarterback that's that good at short yardage, as Matt mentioned, and as a red zone quarterback. Out of his 41 touchdowns, you know, 24 of them came in the red zone. Yeah. 24 of them came in the red zone. 16 Eight rushing passing, touchdowns, 16 all, of them, rushing. all those were in the and red zone. He had, and think about it, he missed two games. All right, until the end of two games. So he was out for the Iowa State game, basically out for the rest of the Baylor game. And he had touchdowns, I believe, from 21 yards passing, from 21 yards, 22, and 23. <laughs> he threw an a interception on the 22-yard line uh, going against Kansas, going in. So there, he actually could have had higher numbers in the red zone. Dude, he's the best red zone weapon in the country. And I'm telling you mm-hmm. right now, when he gets when he gets closer to pay dirt, dude, he is money in the bank. And, and if his knee doesn't hit the ground early in that West Virginia game, that series probably ends with him he taking it. He could easily have right now 30-something red zone touchdowns easily. But m- my point being is that Tom Herman knows this. And Tom Herman's like, okay, I, 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 I know that Sam, Sam hasn't finished a damn football season in four years. All right, well, you know what I mean. Like it's been a long time, but he's so effective when he's in there and when he's healthy. Mm-hmm. So that is the conundrum for Tom Herman. So that's why it is important, you know, how he how he uh, you know proceeds with the rushing game, and that's why Keontae Ingram and Jordan Whittington are so pivotal. Yeah, right. Dude, they're so important because you need them to carry the load. Basically, probably in nine out of those ten games, they're gonna be 
You want those Throughout guys the to set the tone for the running game and the identity of the Here, offense. Here's and, the, absorb, here's the long and absorb that impact. Yeah. Yeah. That's OU, their job is to yeah. help Sam be healthy exactly. to be the best team, and they all work together. I mean, even but, go look at Vince Young's yards. Vince Young didn't always run like crazy. He ran for 200 in the Rose Bowl and 267 in those games because you had to to beat Michigan, to beat exactly. USC, and in those games. But when you go look across the other games in conference or against Baylor, he wasn't doing it, but he was against Ohio State. State. So it's just sort of situations where if you are in situational football and it's going to be third and exactly short, right. you're going to have this. But luckily, your yeah. riskiest tool is also your best tool. So we need to understand that and know exactly. when the values needed to yeah. use them. And then if you're getting a tight game with Oklahoma State, oh, you know Uh-oh. what? BYU, okay, hey, Sam. Or bail us out against Kansas, VY, whatever, whatever it, is. it was when he got runs and is, gets out of the then leg. Then bam, bam, Sam, go win the game for us. But in the meantime, we need to mitigate the damage. Yeah, so to your point, right about usage, nine of the 14 games and that includes Iowa State where he missed the second half and Baylor where he missed all but like four plays or whatever it was uh double digit carries for Sam Ellinger nine of the 14 games his high totals uh and again consider the opponents and, and the nature of the game 15 against Oklahoma uh that was I believe the Big 12 championship game yep uh 15 against Texas Tech 17 against USC, 19 in the first Oklahoma game, 21 against Georgia. And you know what What, what would help that? You Those fourth quarter collapses when Texas is up. You know what I mean? They're up big in games, and then somehow they give up 20-something points. Texas Tech, I believe that happens. Yeah. Oklahoma, the first one, that happens. You know, that can help mitigate some of the dance for Sam. You know what I mean? Because once the game gets close, it's like, all right, now Sam, go win it, baby, at all costs. It's really weird to say your quarterback is your closer in your run game. He but is. He, he is, yeah. He's the closer, dog. He is. And so I think that's that's that, that's the only concern for me. That's why Keontae Ingram, man, he's, that's why they put that 20 pounds on Jordan Whittington and Keontae Ingram, man. We're going to need – they need they're, you could argue right now they're, they're the most pivotal parts – right now of the running game, even more so than Sam, because there's no way you can run Sam that much every game right. and him make it through the 12 games. No and way. It, exactly. Like, to amplify your no point, way. too, that means the Texas offensive line needs to be better because if they're better, Amen. it makes it easier for Ingram. So Amen. then in those situations where it's third and short and short yardage, if you have the coaches be confident that the run game in handing off to Ingram or handing off the ball to somebody can get us that three yards to where we don't even feel as if we have to run Sam all the time. Like, if you can get to the point that your offensive line is so good that the running game can get you those things, it's only going to allow Sam to not only be healthier but also to become more of a weapon because it's something else that's in the conscience of the opponent is that they have a good running game. So whenever he could even increase value and take away the risk of injury, and I'll you don't step- have the insurance policy of a Shane Bouchel behind you either. Right. Yeah, and anymore. Matt, I'll go, I'll go a step further with you on the offensive line. If you get guys that just do a better job of finishing blocks, holding blocks for a split second longer, that's how a 6- or 7-yard run turns into a 15- or 17-yard run. And the 12- to 15-yard runs, those become – your 20 and 30 yard runs that change. And you do have drives. game changers in the backfield now right. that can take advantage of that. Maybe not game changers, Rod, but, you know, the talk from Stan Drayton was Danny Young's done a good job this summer of re- kind of reshaping his body. He felt that's what he needed to do. And knock on wood, Stan Drayton's really high on Kirk Johnson giving them something. He doesn't know what, oh, but well, giving them something. Hey, but something to your but to your point though, if yeah. if you're if you're going to take the strategy of hey, in, in games where you need to take pressure off Sam Ellinger, lighten his workload, you're going to need to rely on the running backs. You're going to need one or both those guys to give you something. Yeah, they're going to have to be yeah, I don't say plus players, but you're going to need to say hey, Danny Young, go give us. I need uh, yeah. five carries. Four, I was going to say, yeah, four or five reps a game. Kirk Johnson, something. go yeah. give us three good carries. Yeah, it's like a bullpen. I just need you to give me a couple of reps. Yeah. No, you're yeah. right. If that, if they're going to – and I think that's the way they have to do it. They're going to have to rely on yeah. the, run, the running back, the running game like that. So I want to close this out with some defensive talk, Rod. I know it's the side of the ball you made your hay on on Let's the 40 it, acres, man. and we enjoy hearing it. Uh, talk to Todd Orlando about defense. And, again, I talked to him. He had his press conference, and I talked to him one-on-one for a little bit. And – he is excited about this defense just in terms of the talent and the speed and the athleticism. He said, you know, the challenge for them is going to be consistency, getting these guys to flash consistently more often. I but he that. said they're probably top 11 guys. When it's clicking, and these were his exact words, you're going to see stuff that hasn't been seen around this program in a long time. 
those are the kind of athletes he feels they've got on defense right now. Yeah, I heard him remark that the speed of this defense might be the fastest, or like basically insinuate it could be the fastest defense that he's had since he's been here, which is saying a lot considering you had a 4-4 Gary Johnson and a 4-5 Malik Jefferson at the heart of your defense in 2017. Yeah. But I think he means overall the D-line is going to be bigger and faster on the D-line. Um, and the defensive backs overall, I think they're just going to be you know, more athletic now with B.J. Foster playing more. Of course, you got Caden Stearns and Brandon Jones, but Anthony Cook and Jalen Green, who I think are going to end up being the corners, but I could be wrong. They're still, apparently, they're still in the competition yeah, with Tyler Kobe Mendel Boyce and Deshaun Jameson. Yeah, it's basically a four-man so, competition, and yeah. I, I think Deshaun Jameson could end up I, – I'm because since Anthony Cook is suspended for the first half of the La Tech game because of the right. targeting penalty – I wouldn't be shocked at all if your starting corners for the La Tech game are Deshaun Jameson and Jalen Green. Okay. I can see that. Yeah. No, I can see that just because Anthony Cook, I, I forgot about him being suspended for the first half of that game. Actually. Yeah, I want to plant that seed now just yeah. so the closer we get, people. So people don't, yeah, because yeah, I actually forgot all about it. Uh, I think Anthony Cook will end up being the corner. Those guys will have their growing pains. It's the Big 12. They're going up against the best receivers and some of the best quarterbacks in the country and the best offensive schemes. So just saying that now, like you said, wanna, <laughs> you want to try to get people uh, ready for Precious. it to temper their expectations. Those young corners are going to have some growing pains. It's going to happen. No period. no corner is it, good as, as good as you are. No corner in this league goes unscathed. Oh, dude, it's the Big 12. Exactly. Hey, Chris Boyd was a first-team All-Big 12 corner. Let that sink in. Yeah. <laughs> as bad as we yeah. got, as bad as we talked about Chris Boyd, hell, him getting into it with Manny Acho because Manny Acho is talking bad on him. Everybody talking bad on him here at Logo the Country. First team all Big 12 cards. NFL so, loves them. <laughs> NFL loves them. So we, trust me, it's just going to happen for those youngsters. But they have a higher ceiling, in my opinion, honestly, than Chris Boyd. Uh, and I, Chris Boyd had a really high ceiling, too. Yeah. So I think the, 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 the three key components to the, the defense, just really quickly. And I heard you uh, talk about it this morning, and I saw you tweet about it too. Number one is the defensive tackle because it's such a, an important position in Todd Orlando that defense. Knows, yeah. That nose tackle. And you're going to entrust that right now to a true sophomore now? Is that Richard Andrew? Freshman. Richard Freshman, actually. Yeah, because he only, okay, yeah, that's, that's how little he played last year. He's a Richard Freshman. But basically, Todd Orlando's not even talking about the other D tackles. No. Nope. He ain't even. He's not even mentioning the other D tackles. <laughs> he really said. He said, "Kendra Coburn's the man." Like, however, how much she plays, that'll determine what we do with D tackle. Right. Wow. He said. He said it's we've like got. He, and he, coming in, it's like that Ocam being added well, to the 05 line. Like it's just a big body that he, you're ready for wow. now. Wow. He mentioned. He's like. That's crazy. He's like. There's, there's some veteran guys, and, and Todd Orlando's a guy. He'll be straight with you. And he was. He said, "There's some other guys, but I'll be honest with you, Cob- I think Coburn's the guy." That's it. <laughs> I'll be I was like, all right, that's all I need to hear. He could have said that about corner too. He'd have, nope, Kel- Coburn's the guy. Y'all Done need deal. to just like find Let's a way on. to get the, sh- the phone line straight to him because he'll just tell you and so, then it's go to the next point. To like, me, for him to jump out on that limb, that says they're pretty confident that that guy has a really high ceiling and he's going to be a yeah. game changer sooner rather than later. Uh, I love what I saw from him uh, versus Georgia in the Sugar Bowl early on when he got reps. So I think – I should be concerned about D tackle because you know you lost a veteran in in, in Chris Nelson and then before that you had Puna Ford who was a kind of a, a once in a generation kind of D tackle. But I I feel good about Keandre Coburn. That's the that's, I think that was the one that's kind of the number one thing I was concerned about. Number two, I think the the most important piece is probably going to be Joseph Asai, and not not in terms of he's going to be the most impactful player, but you need him to be able to play outside inside. If he can play outside and play inside. That gives you a lot of versatility. It manufactures depth for you on that on that um, on that linebacking core, and also it makes you multiple. From yeah. it literally within the down, he can come down and give you a four man front, or you can back it off and go three three five, or you could go. You know what I mean? You could go four two uh, four two six, whatever you want to do. Depending on four two five, depending on what you know you want to do with him and how versatile of a piece he is. So the, what ties into that to me, Rod, is something when I got T.O. one-on-one and I asked him about Osai Point Blank. I said, do you, I mean, we saw it in the spring and then in the spring game. Do you feel like he can really play inside? And he said, yeah. And he said, because basically one of the, the, the move of B.J. Foster to nickel for him was twofold. One, it was – they feel like he can be more versatile there. His skill set playing close to the box mm-hmm. on a hash where that nickel plays. They feel like the skill set will translate pretty easy. But two, it's about getting your best 11 on the field. Yeah, and that. playing B.J. Foster at the second level 
you've got a starting caliber player at the second level. So regardless of whether you have Osai on the edge or inside or whatever, for Todd Orlando, the key is this. On every down, whether you're talking about sub packages, whatever, do you have your best 11 players on the field? Yeah, and and B.J. Foss is a DB with linebacker tendencies. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I, and I, I, I love that move. And I think – he also is why he's the third piece that's most important because he makes you multiple too. Right. All right. So you can go from having a dying package to a nickel package with BJ Foster in there because he can come down to the linebacker depth and play the run and fill the gap and fill the alley. And he can also blitz. He's probably your best blitz, right? I think he is. Yeah. <laughs> you know I, think I, mean? he, I think he was last year. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? So I, those are three. Can, if those three pieces are performing at a really high level, BJ Foster, Joseph Asai, and Kendra Coburn, this defense can exceed expectations and it can actually, you know, reach its ceiling. And but if not, if those pieces struggle, it's gonna be tough on the defense. Those pieces to yeah. me are the most important components right now. He, and and uh, an encouraging thing else I can I pretty much trust. Something encouraging he mentioned in the press conference mm-hmm. portion was and it's stuff we've kind of talked about when and not that he didn't like him as a prospect because they loved him, but he said that he questioned some of the athleticism stuff with Delia Day away just in terms of is he stiff? Can he move? Mm. You know, how does he move? In space. And the Todd from Todd Orlando, straight from his mouth, he said the improvements he uh, Dayway made in the spring and what he's done this summer, he doesn't question that stuff near as much as he did before. There you go. So was Delia Dayway ready to take a step? Rod, it, it, when you look at the big picture, I don't want us to come off as homers because anybody that's listened to this podcast since we started knows we, we will be critical of this program. But to me – I trust the talent too much and I trust the staff too much to get the most out of it that it's hard not to be really excited about what's getting ready to happen. Yeah, um, because the defense, yes, they're losing a lot. They're losing a ton. The most they've lost arguably in the modern era of Texas football on defense, but they're replacing it with high-end talent with really high ceilings. It's just inexperienced. It's just unproven commodities. And that's why I said the the uncertainty around B.J. Foster at the nickel playing that now, that big nickel that they're now playing. But basically they were in big nickel last year because P.J. PJ Locke is basically a safety too. But big nickel just means having three safeties on the field, which is what B.J. Foster, Caden Stearns, and Brandon Jones will be. Uh, And and the uncertainty around Joseph Asai, whether he can play inside and play outside. And like you said, a day away too, the uncertainty at linebacker period because there's so much inexperience there. And the athleticism of a day away, and whether he can work in space, and then the the inexperience at defensive tackle. So it's at those strategic positions where the inexperience, I think, can be exploited the most. I think nickel may be the most, and I've said this before on the show, the most important defensive position in the Big Twelve yeah. for any team. You better it, it, for uh, Iowa State. It's, I call, they call it their star, right? right. Their whatever they are. Yeah. Everybody's got a different name for it. Gary Patterson, his nickel position is is crucial. I, it, because that guy has to do so much, he's got to blitz, he's got to be a run stopper, he's got to cover man to man. Sometimes I got to back him up and play him in the zone because he's got to do all those things. You got to find a, a hell of a football player, not just you know a good cover guy or a good run stuffer or a guy that's physical. You got to find somebody that can be the best all around football player, arguably on your defense. PJ Locke described playing nickel to me like this. He said, one snap you're running thirty yards with a slot receiver down the field. The very next snap. You're setting the edge, taking on a 300 pound pulling guard. You know what I mean? Like that's how that's how diverse you have to be playing the nickel. Exactly. So I, that, you know, BJ Foster. That's why he's 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 crucial, man. If he works out, wow, watch out for this defense, man. Watch out for him because I think everywhere else, I, you know, even at corner, I got confidence at corner. I got you know Malcolm Roach and Taquan Graham. I got a lot of confidence. I got a lot of confidence. I mean, our safeties, obviously. I'm, I'm probably overconfident in our safeties. You know what I mean? I, I got a confidence in a lot of other spots. Those three, I think there's a lot of uncertainty. But if they can exceed expectations, this defense is going to be really good. Well, we'll uh, we'll hit some more of it next week. Uh, <laughs> but right now we need to get to some recruiting talk uh, with Mike Roach. Ooh. All right, we're going to try something different this week uh, as we bring in Mike Roach to talk recruiting, Horns 24-7 recruiting editor. Mike, uh, I guess we're good, right? Everything, Everything's working so far? I believe. Okay. I hear you loud and clear. Yeah. Uh, we've had some complaints about the audio, which, you know, when Mike's on a phone, it, it kind of is what it is. But, you know, he wasn't driving for last week's episode. But um, And we'll perfect this. We're on Skype right now. So as I get a text message coming in uh, online. But we'll – 
look, we'll continue to tweak this and figure it out, and we'll eventually get it to where there's no issues. But, uh, Mike, overall, man, just how's it going? I don't think we've we've gotten enough time to kind of get into, like, the personal side of things with you, you know, making the move and coming over, even going back to coming over from Horn Sports and, and all that stuff. So before we get into, like, the nitty-gritty, which I know everybody wants to, to hear about, um, how are you doing with the move overall, man? You've been with us. How long have you been at 24-7? Uh, this would be, I started right before the 2018 cycle, so like February of the 2018 cycle. Right, so so that would be, uh, so let's, say two, let's say two and a half years. Yeah, 2017, so yeah, two and a half years. So, I mean, in you, I think, I, I just don't think people know your background, man. Like when you came over, as was the case when you were in Horn Sports, you had a full-time job, and you were still working that full-time job where you were working part-time with us you were uh titles are fickle and don't mean a whole lot to me but i guess you were number two behind ej for a while uh, and then you got promoted to the full-time role um oh man i, I just don't think people understand like your passion for the recruiting industry because like i said to do this on a part-time basis takes uh it just takes a lot of want to a lot of desire so now that you're in the full-time role man how are you liking it i mean it's great it's a dream job like it's it's really hard to find um, you know, anything, <laughs> there's gripes about just about anything in the world, you know, but when you think about it, if your job is to wake up and worry about football, especially high school football, it's, it's pretty, pretty easy life. Um, that said, I mean, there's still some challenges. I think today was a, was a pretty busy day, uh, yeah. on the, on the recruiting front. And, you know, I think, I think the thing I even, you know, you mentioned I've done this for a while, so I'm used to it, but I, there was always a thing of, Mike's part time, so we're not going to ask that much out of him. Now, I think I went kind of above and beyond to do more, and that's kind of landed me in the role where I am. But I wasn't necessarily asked to do more. Um, right. Um, and there was always a part of me that could turn it off when I needed to. Um, and now it's it's kind of I guess the biggest thing I struggle with is you're kind of always on, or you always have to be plugged in and tuned in. And um, it doesn't so much bother me. I mean, there are certain times I would certainly love to just turn off my phone and, and relax, but. Um, it doesn't so much bother me. I think it more like my wife deals with it. Um, you know, and she's done a great job. Like she's been the most supportive person in my life when it comes to this job. And, um, you know, years and years of horn sports of, of working for next, uh, you know, and kind of paying for myself to travel so I could go see recruits and, and events and, um, and put in the work the way I thought it needed to be done to be able to turn this into a full-time opportunity one yeah. day. Um, you know, she's been there every step of the way supporting me figuring out how to make it work financially for us. And, um, you know, she's dealt with a lot of, a lot of long weekends with me being gone or Friday nights with me being gone. So, um, you know, it's more than fair, but I think sometimes, you know, she wants me to be able to turn it off and I just can't, that's probably the toughest thing I deal with, but you know, in the end, it's a lot better than punching a clock and, uh, you know, it's a, it's a real blessing to be able to do it. Yeah, man, the, we worked for 24-7 sports, and that is literal, man. You're never off the clock, especially when you're on the beat. I mean, I, I can remember some commitments, Mike, based on, like, I remember when Kyle Hicks committed to Texas. I remember my wife and I, it, it had been, you know, we'd gone through signing day and all that stuff, and it was kind of post-junior day, and uh, we're going to, you know, a nice dinner, and literally we walk in the restaurant, I get a phone call. It's like, hey, you need to get a story ready. Kyle Hicks is about to commit to Texas. So it's just stuff like that. You know, it, it's – look, we're not complaining. As Mike said, we have great jobs. We get to wake up every morning and worry about football, which is awesome. We're living the dream. But, uh, you know, time management is is pretty rough. And I'll tell you what, we'll get more to the personal stuff, Mike, because I just think, you know, some of that's uh, just kind of – to some, to on some level, it's kind of cathartic, but I think people just to be able to put not just a name, but a person with the face uh, when they see you or, or anything like that, I, I think it's always a good thing. And, you know, we kind of rev- we do it on the Blitz with myself, Matt and Rob. We kind of, you know, let people a little bit into to the personal life as much as we can. So I think that's important. But why everybody's listening to this right now is you want to hear the goods with Texas recruiting. And, man, actually – you gave the kid props on Twitter because very rare is it that something goes so under the radar is kept so quiet that it catches pretty much an entire market of reporters by surprise. But I actually woke you up because I had Twitter notifications about Hayden Connor, the four-star offensive lineman out of Katie Taylor posting a commitment video. And I was like, is this a rib? I was like, I need to call Mike, figure out what's going on. And sure enough, it was legit. Uh, Mike, this is number one when you're talking about a prospect of this caliber, a great get for Texas. 
but number two, um, this is a, I think you could say it is a direct effect of the Jalen Monroe commitment because this kind of happened out of nowhere. Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, Hayden said as much. And first of all, I've got to give props once again to the Longhorn Blitz. I've been on this beat full time since when? Late March, early April. And it was the slowest recruiting cycle I can think of. We've now done three shows together, Jeff. And in that time, we've talked about multiple, multiple commitments. So props to the bump that the Longhorn Blitz gave Texas recruiting. Yeah, I think we're at five now. Yeah. Yeah, I, that's wild. I mean, we I don't think I've done like five on my own before that time, really. So, <laughs> uh, um, yeah, it, it, Hayden kind of came out of nowhere. It was funny. It was I was I've been gathering information on who's coming in to visit. So I've been reaching out to kids this week and I reached out to Hayden uh, last night and said, hey, man, are you are, uh, visiting Texas this Friday uh, for their camp? And. Hayden is usually like right back to me. He usually has no problem getting right back to me. And I didn't hear back from him. And I kind of thought, that's weird. And after you called me this morning and after I kind of sifted through everything, got all of our, all of our stories up, I saw I had a message from him and it said, yep. And it had the video tagged in it. And I was just like, okay, he was, uh, he was playing the game a little bit yesterday, yeah. but he said it when I talked to him this afternoon that, um, you know, he was kind of down to Texas and Michigan. And Milrow's commitment kind of made him go ahead and take the jump. I mean, that was was a direct result of of Milrow's commitment. Uh, two guys that played uh, youth football together and, and known each other for a long time. And um, I mean, Jalen Milrow's. Uh, I've mentioned this a couple times in in a couple different areas. So I'm not sure if I've done it on here, but um, Jalen Milrow's the, the way he's been re- described to me of his magnetism as a recruiter is very strong. It's something I don't think Texas has had at the quarterback position in a while. And I think it's yeah. a little bit of a different thing when you have that at the quarterback position versus having a linebacker like the Gabriel Floyd be the vocal one or, or, or something like that. You know, I think when you have the guy who is looked at as the leader, um, be the, your, your best recruiter on the trail, that's a huge weapon. Yeah. I mean, just thinking back to Texas recruiting classes, uh, you know, maybe Connor Brewer was that kind of guy. Uh, you know, I think, I think Gerard Hurd kind of had some of that cachet, but things at Texas were just such a mess at the time. And, you know, the coaching change kind of blew everything up in, in that cycle, whatever had the potential to happen, uh, you know, kind of got disintegrated, whether it was, you're talking about Jamal Adams or Solomon Thomas or whoever. Uh, but yeah, I mean, shoot, Mike, I mean, you, you've got to think like, this is almost like and I don't even, you can't even say it's Vince Young level stuff because he wasn't in the class for the whole cycle. I mean, this is a kid that uh, the only thing you can really compare it to just based on the feedback that we've gotten so far, he might have to go all the way back to 99. I mean, he's having like a Corey Redding type impact on this class where this is one guy in a major metro area. And, and maybe, cause I, but I don't even know if Texas really got the residual from Malik Jefferson like this, but one guy in a major metro area that is going to have an impact in swinging several big time recruits. Like this is, this is something something Texas hasn't had in a long time. Talk about swinging. I mean, Katie is a, probably one of the biggest A&M strongholds in the, in the state. Um, Seems like pound for pound, more guys head to A&M and more uh, former Aggies live in that area than anywhere else. And uh, especially at, you know, at Katie Taylor where, where Hayden Connor goes to school They've had guys over the past couple of years, Max Wright and uh, Braden Mowry and uh, uh, Ori. Cam- Robert Cameron Ori, yeah, Cameron Ori. Um, all come out of Taylor. You know, they were established a pipeline to that school. And uh, for Texas to be able to come out and uh, land Connor off the bat, land uh, Milro from Katy, that's a big answer going into 2021. And, you know, they're going to have a chance to land some other guys in that area. Yeah. So let's just talk about Hayden Connor just as a prospect. And I've heard you describe him, you know, as a high floor type kid. Uh, And this was a guy, Mike, that he's kind of a unique athlete, was a a running back, you know, when he was younger. So, um, you know, you can only correlate that athleticism at that age of development to now so much. But I think it just kind of shows you just the fact that this kid isn't a slug. And I know when you take bigger linemen that are already in that 290 to 300 area, you kind of worry about, okay, is he slow footed? If he adds another 10 pounds, how's this going to impact his athleticism? But it doesn't seem like there's much worry about that with this kid. 
I think his feet are a little bit of a worry. I don't think he is as high end of an athlete as you'd like on the offensive line. But the thing I really like about Hayden is he's he's a smart kid. Um, he is incredibly hardworking. He's going to be the type of kid that that goes to work on the deficiencies in his game. I think guys like Yancey McKnight and Herb Hand are going to love him because he's going to soak up everything they give him. And right. um, he's he's also I think a product of. I mean, this kid's been a known commodity since his eighth grade year. Like people have known about him since his eighth grade year, and he's been talked about in that way. Was getting offers as a freshman. I've always said this, and I, I fully believe it. When guys are good for that long, I think there's a natural tendency that by the time they come around to their senior year, people start finding things wrong with them. And, yeah. Uh, and you know, I, it happened with Noah Kane. I think that people, you know, Noah Kane was such a known commodity that uh, by the time he got to to sign me, people were saying, "Well, he's not that good." Well, I think he's very good, and I think. You know, I think Connor is is probably an interior guy, but I think he has some swing tackle potential. Um, I think that he's going to be an incredibly solid player, a great culture fit. I don't see him having the upside of like a Tommy Brockermeyer, or Savian Bird, or guys like that. But you talk about a guy that is going to come in probably close to to ready weight wise. Um, he's going to early enroll, so he'll get a spring of of the weight room and, and soaking that in. I think that kid's going to have a potential to make an impact off the bat. Yeah, I mean, you're talking, you're talking about smart. I mean, I believe he's going to be an aerospace engineering major. That's that's the plan for him. Yeah, it's it's so funny because um, so that whole group of offensive linemen's like really close, and they're all kind of dorks. Like they're all kind of really smart. Um, and I was talking to Donovan Jackson, who's like could go to Stanford without playing football. Um, yeah, he's that smart. And I was talking to him about Hayden, and he said, "Yeah, Hayden's a nerd." Um, so I mean. <laughs> Like if, if Donovan Jackson's calling you a nerd, uh, you, you, you're pretty much up there. But yeah, he's really into aerospace engineering and to, like he wants to uh, do something with NASA. I think it's like part of their launch for. Um, he came down in June and spoke with a UT professor for a while about their aerospace engineering program and um, went really in depth. I actually did a story on it. One of my favorite stories I've done. Um, and you know, we hear kids all the time talk about their their education and what they want to do. And, like, every kid wants to be, like, an engineer or something, right? That's really right. hard to do when you're playing football. This is one kid that I really buy. Like, okay, he can do it. Yeah. Um, you know, and it's funny you mentioned that. I don't think there's two things to that. One, you know, Tom Herman, and I heard this at the THSEA convention when he spoke. He was part of the D1 coaches panel. And they kind of, basically how they do that, they give all the coaches, all 12 coaches, a chance to, hey, pump up your program. Like, what's great about TCU or Texas State or UTSA or, you know, Texas A&M? And Tom Herman got the microphone, and he basically talked about the total package. And a big part of that is the power of the degree you get from Texas. And I know that doesn't work with every kid, Mike, but a kid like Caden Connor, that's going to resonate you know, pretty hardcore. And, and, and I think that, that with that 21 class, I think that pitch, it seems like, is having more of an impact than maybe it's had in other classes. Yeah, um, I think that that's kind of buying in, especially with the 21 group. It's a bunch of smart kids, like I mentioned, and, you know, Texas tries to push that overall package and, you know, what they can do academically, life after football, the uh, uh, the Texas uh, the Forever program, is that what it's yeah. called? I can't remember. Yeah. I can't remember, but, you know, that, that score is huge with parents, and I think that every once in a while you'll get a group that, that really resounds with, you know, 99% of kids who talk about academics and their recruitment really don't care about academics because you'll see them go to schools that obviously don't prioritize academics. <laughs> right, right. Um, but you do get that 1% that do actually really, really care about what their education is, and, um, you know, Hayden's part of it. I think there's a few other guys in this class star as well. You know, Mike, I had a second point I was going to make on that, but I forgot it midstream during that rant. So I'll, if I come back to it, I'll come back to it. But if it pops up. But so we talked about him as a prospect and I want to get to the residuals, you know, what that means for the other linemen, because good Lord, you just mentioned some names in Savian Bird, Tommy and James Brockermeyer, Bryce Foster. I mean, this is a loaded, a historically loaded, I think, offensive line class in the state in 2021. But. I want to shift over to Jalen Milrow. And, you know, when you talk about taking a quarterback, man, th- th- this, the process of taking quarterbacks now fascinates me because you're the bigger schools. I guess I, I thought about this at the coaching convention. I thought about this when Seth Luttrell was talking about Mason Fine, who is a really, really, anybody that hasn't watched UNT, 
Mason finds a really, really good college quarterback. And it almost makes me think, Mike, like the smaller schools like that have a better chance, I think, sometimes than the big schools in today's climate to get that position right because they get more time to vet a kid and really see, okay, how smart is this kid? Is he a system fit? Yada, yada, yada. Whereas if you're Texas, you know, and Tom Herman's talked about they just have to do as much due diligence as possible when they take a kid that early. I mean, they took they took Roshan Johnson really early. They took Hudson. They took Hudson Card when he hadn't made, you know, I don't think he had made a varsity start at that point. I know he'd played some quarterback for Lake Travis as a sophomore, especially later in the playoffs when Matthew Baldwin got hurt. But they took Johnson early. They took Card early. They're taking Jalen Milrow early. I mean, you can only be sure to a certain extent what type of kid you're getting because in some cases maybe you've gotten him in a camp or two and then you've got sophomore film. That's pretty much it. You've got to make the call at that point. That's not a great position to be in if you're one of these big schools. Yeah, absolutely. And I think with, with Texas, um, you know, it's – it's quarterback, you're right. Re- quarterback recruiting is the most fascinating thing in the world because you have to approach it differently than you approach any other position. You almost have to – take two every year because of the transfer portal, but taking two every year ensures one's going to go into the transfer portal. Yeah. So it's like a weird, sick <laughs> circle that you live in. And, right. uh, you, you know, you really can't miss because you're taking one in most cases. And um, I, you really have to nail that recruitment and that, and that evaluation. For Texas, I think it came down to, uh, you know, really looking at Milrow versus Preston Stone. They like both guys a lot. I think they felt very comfortable with both guys. Um, and that's really kind of the position you want to be in where you have multiple targets and you're not all your eggs in one basket for one guy. Um, right. You know, I think that they – don't get me wrong. They love Preston Stone. They would have loved for Preston Stone to be part of this class. But in the end, Preston wasn't ready to make his decision, and Jalen Milrow does. And I think that if you start turning down guys because you have another guy, that's how you get into Mac Brown and, and Kevin Sumlin territory, and that's how you do your program a disservice to where you've got – in three or four years, you've got Tyron Swoop starting and no depth behind him. Um, you know, those are things that happen when you do. Don't that. So don't I, remind me about that era, Mike. That took that that whole time period of Texas football took like five years off of my life. I mean, wasn't there was a time when it was like Swoops and like his backup was like Matt Merrick or something at one point, wasn't it? Uh, yeah. If you go to the that fourteen season, um, Ash gets hurt. David Ash gets hurt in the North Texas game. He's done forever. Um, and then Swoops is the guy. And really, I mean, if something happened to Swoops, uh, it wasn't even Merrick. Ah, gosh, it was one of the walk-ons. I don't think it was John Paul Floyd, but I think it was maybe oh. one of the walk-ons. I mean, you got to refresh my memory, Mike. I've tried to, like, block that out. Yeah, I can't recall either. But, like, literally, was it like Logan Vinkirk? Is that a name? Vink, that Logan name? Vlickerek might have been around that time, but basically, like, their option, like, had something happen to Swoops where he was going to miss several games. Like, their only real option was, okay, pull the red shirt off Gerard Hurd and go or with like God. like Jalen Overstreet, right? Was Jalen no, Overstreet? Oh, oh, no, Over, Overstreet was gone by that point. Oh, yeah. So, cool. yeah, I mean, basically, yes. And, and I kind of, uh, you know, I wrote a piece because we had rankings update on Tuesday, and I, I wrote about it because, uh, you know, Barton Simmons, our director of scouting, which I know, look, Barton gets a bad rap, but, Mike, I, I think you and I can both agree, like, he's, number one, he's got the thick skin to handle being in the position he's in, which it's any position like that. It, it's just a heat-seeking position, like you can't win being in that chair. Uh, but, two, He's extremely accessible. I mean, if you need quotes or whatever, or just chop it up with him for a story, I mean, Barton's great. And Barton had some really good things to say. It's kind of about the direction Texas is going recruiting quarterbacks. And not only are they getting guys who are system fits, they're setting themselves up to where when Sam Ellinger leaves, they're going to have multiple options. Uh, And now you look at Jalen Milrow, now he's going to be part of that mix. So, um, sorry if I kind of bogarted your time there, Mike, on talking about quarterbacks, but yeah, I mean, I, I think you're spot on. I mean, it's, you, you have to take them knowing they're going to transfer and knowing, okay, one of these, if you take two, it's like, okay, one of these two guys, maybe both isn't going to be here. But like you said, man, as good of a prospect as Preston Stone might be. And I know Chris Hummer had a story late, kind of late spring, early summer, uh, 
asking the question, is he Johnny Manziel 2.0? Obviously, just strictly from a football standpoint, but that's the kind of dynamic quarterback that a lot of people think he can be. But like you said, I think for the Texas staff, it was just so close in their evaluation that when Jalen Milrose was ready to pull the trigger, you'd be doing your program a disservice if you told him, no, hang on, we're not ready to take this. Yeah, I mean, I, was, I, I couldn't agree with you more. And I think that Texas is at a point, and of course, you know, all it takes is an off season and multiple quarterbacks going to the portal to be in a bad point again. But I think they're at a point where they feel good with the quarterback depth they're bringing in. Um, Noro is a bit more of a, I wouldn't even call him a project. He just has some development to do. Like, I don't yeah. think he's a passing project. He, he needs to work on some of his lower body disassociation stuff. But, um, you know, outside of that, I wouldn't say he's like super far behind. He's not Jaquentin Jackson as a passer. He's not Tyron Swoops. I mean, he is a very, very capable quarterback and uh, gives you the dual threat option that, that everybody loves. And plus the recruiting bounce, I just don't. I mean, look, I, you'll find no bigger fan of Preston Stone in this world than me. Um, I've known him forever. I've, I've thought very highly of this game forever. But I think that uh, that Milrow was just an excellent, excellent take for Texas. Yeah. It, one thing, and I've only watched this tape. I'm hoping to, to get over there and, and watch him play this year. And I know KDISD with the 19 high schools that are in KDISD now. You can get some Thursday games or, you know, the Saturday game if I've got if I managed to get a Saturday off or whatever. But you watch his tape, Mike, and like you said, like he's not a developmental guy in terms of you think, okay, this guy is completely raw and you gotta kinda break him down to build him back up. Like you watch the tape and you say, Okay, like the arm strength is there, like he he can whip it, he can spin it. Obviously the athleticism there and Tom Herman talked about this when when he got to Texas. Um, you know, you don't need a home run hitter like a Braxton Miller. You can have singles and doubles hitters. You know, JT Barrett was one of those guys. Shane Bouchelle is clearly one of those guys. This kid just watching the tape strikes me as a home run hitter when he's got the ball in his hands. Absolutely. And I think, you know, you, you, we talk about him having to improve some things. I was the same way with Cameron Rising. And I know everybody thought Cameron Rising was the second coming. There were a lot of things I thought Cameron Rising needed to improve coming out of high school. And so... Um, and I don't think anybody would ever call him a project. So, right. um, you know, Milrow has was a legit as a sophomore four six three guy. I think on the laser at the opening in the forty, uh, awesome shuttle, birded well. So great athlete. He's going to get faster. Um, you know, it's people will people will look at four six and say it's not that good. Uh, first of all, on the laser for a high school sophomore, it's fantastic. Um, and uh, people will have a, a very unrealistic view of forty times. Uh, but that's, yeah. that's a rant for another day. Um, but, uh, you know, I think that he is a kid that can – he is one that can find the seam and go. And uh, it may not always go for a touchdown, but he's going to pick you up chunk yardage um, on his feet. And, you know, I've, I've got a piece coming out. And I don't know when this podcast will release, but um, I've got a piece coming out tomorrow morning, which will be Wednesday morning, where I spoke with the, uh, with the KD Tompkins uh, head coach about him. And he just talked about his hunger to compete, um, his his will to uh, to win, his will as a competitor, um, and just all the great intangibles that that you get out of him. And I think that those are so important when it comes to quarterback, being able to get a good mental evaluation of a guy, and knowing he's got some things other than the obvious talent is is always huge. If you want to know my opinion, Mike, of Jalen Milrow, if you want to look at one, like one statistic that tells you, okay, this kid's got a chance to be legit, look at the record for Thompson in 2017 and then in 2018. They go from 0-9 to 10-3 and 3 Yeah, I with mean, him as their starting quarterback. Yeah, he, you know, and so uh, I'm very interested. I know a lot of people are – I think people were so in on Stone for a long time that they kind of were like, well, what the heck, but um, – I'm very interested to see what Jalen's junior year brings because I think that that's where you see most of the growth as a quarterback. Yeah, like I said, I mean that's that's one position. I, I mean, I remember when you know Roshan Johnson committed, and the debate on the site was, well, should you have waited for for Grant Tisdale? Well, I mean, you know, if you're a staff, if you trust your eval, if you know what you're looking at, then at that position, man, take the kid that's ready to commit. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you you you. Don't succeed in this world turning down commitments from four-star guys. You just don't. That's a great point. I, I think I think people need to file that one away, because because that is where Mac Brown screwed up. In all honesty, I mean there was a lot of that going on at Texas, not just the quarterback, but 
man in other positions. And dude, if you want to, like, if you want a textbook and roster mismanagement, go look at Mac Brown kind of post national championship and some of the things that were happening in some of those recruiting classes. But I digress, Mike. So, uh, you know, Texas got a big recruiting event coming up this weekend. We're at stars at night. I think that's what we're going with for the camp name now. Yeah, Stars at Night, which is their annual invite camp um, that they do every July once a dead period lifts. It's a cool event. I mean, it is a little bit like a camp, but they'll also have like a water balloon fight and slam dunk contest. So they try to throw a little bit of fun in there. Um, it's actually produced some some good moments over the years. You know, Rashawn Johnson committed there a couple of years ago. Jalen Green committed there uh, during his cycle. Um Last year, Tyler Owens was offered there. That's where Texas found Tyler Owens. So, yeah. um, I mean, obviously not found. They knew about him. They, that's why they invited him. But that's where they offered him, and everything began. So, yeah, always something interesting comes out of that camp. Uh, not stars of night, but I was thinking about uh, Charlie Strong's under the lights camp. I was one of about four or five times Jordan Elliott committed to Texas was at one of those things. But that's a that's a that's a story for another day that we'll share on, on another podcast when there's not so much going on. But Mike, overall, man, when you look at this event and just the stuff surrounding the the, the Milrow commitment, I know there's a lot there's a lot of rumor and innuendo out there now that okay, you've already seen one domino fall in the Houston area, and we know you know Hayden Connor and Jalen Milrow have ties to some big time prospects in the in the greater Houston area. Um, over under on commitments in the next week, man, I'll set it at you know two and a half. You taking the over or the under? I'm still working out how, how the dominoes are going to fall, but as of right now, I'll take the over. There you have it. I mean, that's th- this is it's really weird. I know you're working on a story on this, and I don't want to steal your thunder, but we, we talked about you know the the 21 class, the pitch that Texas has seems to be resonating more. But man, if you were wondering where that bump from the Sugar Bowl was going to come, it, it wasn't really in the 20 class. I think that's what we're seeing in the 21 class. That's my opinion anyway. I think that group maybe more so than the 20 class that was kind of in wait and see mode. I think they kind of see the 21 class sees the trajectory Texas is on. And I think that's why you're seeing some guys pull the trigger. Yeah. And well, I mean, if you think about it as the 20 class was the, the sugar bowl happened, you know, kind of going into their cycle. And at that point, whether guys want to talk about it or not, a lot of guys are pretty much starting to make up their minds and at least starting to narrow things down. And um, I don't know if one game can change their minds, but at that point, you know, sophomores are still very open and very impressionable. And uh, yeah, I think that's where we're going to see the impact here. So we talked about Jalen Milrow. We talked about Hayden Connor. Uh, Vernon Broughton was last week. We talked about Prince Dorba, Van Fillinger. I mean, Mike, like you said, man, we're on a roll. Like we should have, it's our fault. Cause if we had done this podcast, a few weeks ago, maybe Texas could have had this wave of momentum this summer. And I would have been better at my job. <laughs> hey, real quick, um, before we break this off, I do want to uh, get into an offer that went out uh, Monday evening. And I'm getting my days mixed up. What's Monday? What's Tuesday? Who knows at this point? Or maybe, yeah, we're recording this on Tuesday. So this was today. Anyway, I'll stop rambling if I can talk right now. Uh, the offer goes out to Jaron Thompson, the safety from Lufkin. Highly regarded kid. Um, well, you know, Gabe Brooks actually put in a crystal ball pick for uh, Jaron Thompson to Texas. Uh, what do you what do you make of this, Mike? I know you know Chris Thompson's still out there, uh, Texas to recruit Xavier and Alford, but this offer on the table to Jaron Thompson, what do you make of it? I think it's in response to losing out on Bryson Washington and Lathan Ransom. I think that uh, Jaron Thompson has the ability to play either nickel or deep safety and so they like that i think texas is always like jaron thompson right but they just haven't liked him as much as the other guys on the board and i don't think that they were prepared to offer him until they were prepared to take him and i think they're at a point now where they would do that so um you know i think that uh he's a from what i, I haven't seen a ton of jaron so um i'm kind of relying on some other people but from what i hear a very good player a little bit undersized um not a not a plus plus athlete, but you know a very good player out there in East Texas. And you know these Texas guys are kind of just bred different. But um, from what we're hearing, you know Gabe actually gave me a call and told me what he was hearing before putting in his crystal ball. Our guy Clint Buckley is is a made man out in East Texas, so he's kind of I'm letting him run lead on this recruitment. He's got sources out there that he's talking to who are also telling us very good things. 
you know, we want to do a little bit more of information gathering maybe before we put in a crystal ball. Um, but I, I think as of now, things look pretty good for Texas there. Yeah. And look, people can say what they want, but I'll look at, okay, who's offered this kid and, and the two offers to me that really stand out. Um, number one is the Arkansas offer because you know, Jeff trailer signed off on it and I trust his evaluations. Uh, and when you talk about defensive backs, if Gary Patterson offers you and is willing to take your commitment, that to me speaks volumes of you as a player. Yeah, I totally agree on that. I, I would always bird dog Gary Patterson's DB evaluation. <laughs> yeah, I mean, when you look at just look at his secondary now, I mean, Ennis Gaines and Jeff Gladney, more so Jeff Gladney. Jeff Gladney was a guy that I think Texas liked. I just don't know that they knew really what they would do with him. Uh, and then Ennis Gaines was a guy that they liked. I forget it was Gaines. I think the 16 cycle, maybe maybe it was 17. I don't remember. But um, yeah, I mean those were two guys that Texas recruited, and you've seen obviously Gary Patterson's got got a really good track record uh, with defensive backs. Mike, anything we missed uh, on, on this week's portion, recruiting portion of the Blitz that that needs to get hit on? I don't think so. I mean, follow us uh, at Horns 24-7. Subscribe to the site. We'll have a bunch of information coming out of Stars at Night, following Stars at Night. Um, I'm going to do all this in the midst of a vacation and try to take to Galveston and then drive to Austin and back to Galveston and um, not anger my family. Uh, So (laughs) um, pray for me there. And, um, yeah, I mean, I would just say follow follow me on Twitter um, and uh, go subscribe to the site, and you can read just about everything that comes out of that weekend. Yeah, real, real quick before we get out of here, um, I, I do want to mention this because you brought it up with Jaron Thompson. You know, Texas, you know, liked him, but you know, when you put the offer out there, you better be prepared to take a commitment. And, and I don't know like how people haven't still figured this out, but it seems like once or twice a day on Twitter, I see why are all these out of state schools offering Texas kids, and the in state schools can't put offers out. Well, I think if you're regardless of whether you're Texas or Texas A&M, but I mean, if you're Texas Tech or you're Baylor or TCU or, you know, U of H, whoever, I mean, if you're an in-state school and you put an offer out on the table to an in-state kid, you better be prepared to take the commitment because like if you're Alabama or, you know, Ohio State or or just an out-of-state school that, yeah, maybe you recruit Texas, you know, in the spring and in the fall when you can get out on the road and maybe you might go to a high school and, kind of carpet bomb them with like 10 different offers for kids. Uh, if that ends up being a non-committable offer, it's not that big of a deal. But man, if you, if you're one of the big schools in Texas, one of those FBS schools in Texas and you offer a kid and you can't take the commitment and then that kid is out of options now, um, man, with the pool high school coaches have in the state, Mike, that's something that can kill you for years if you're a coaching staff and you play that hand wrong. Yeah. And it's just, generally a fundamental lack of understanding of the way recruiting works by people on Twitter, which happens every day in my job. So, <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, it's you just in state schools are held to a different standard and it's simple. Um, you know, if Alabama chooses not to take a kid, that high school is probably not going to shut Alabama out of it for coming and recruiting it again. Right. Texas, they've got a little more pull with, so um, it happens all the time. I think that, yeah, that's why you see Tom Herman much more deliberate with offers. Yeah, Texas, I think uh, I think they've issued the fewest offers of, of anybody in the Big 12 in, in this 2020 cycle, which isn't shocking. I mean, it's not – gosh, Mike, see, talking about recruiting, man, reminds me when I was on the recruiting beat, and it makes me think of all these Mac Brown-isms that just, like, I get this twitch again. But, like, uh, it just – you know, Mac would get up there during a signing day press conference and, well, you know – we offered 34 guys and we got 25 guys in this class. And it's like, well, now I understand like being selective and making sure you don't fill up, but man, you're only extending the net 34 guys. Like how willing were you to, to, you know, go get in the fight with some guys. And in max case, sometimes some years, uh, they weren't, weren't really willing to go get in the fight. But like we talked about last week, man, I, I think if you're a Texas fan, whether you're winning or losing some of these, you know, recruiting battles, you're seeing the staff do that. I think this Tom Harmon staff has proven that number one, they can win their fair share of these battles for kids. And number two, man, they're just not, they're not afraid to get in the fight. You know, even though you know, they know a guy like Chris Thompson's going to go for a while and they're going to have to have some, some pretty stiff competition. And we talked about that with Vernon Broughton and some other guys that they've got in the class and that they're chasing. But uh, you know, that's that Mike is how you build a championship roster. Absolutely. I mean, it's, you gotta be willing to fight and, 
I think, but you got to be smart about it as well. So it's not a job I would want. I mean, I don't no. know envy having to make those decisions. No, I mean, when anybody asks me, why do you write instead of coach? I'm like, well, the job security is much better in, in our field. And he, even that's not saying a lot, Mike, because you know how fickle this, this industry can be at times and how much turnover there is. So, you know, right. lesser the lesser the two evils, I guess. That's a bad way to put it. But on that note, I'm, uh, I'm done rambling, and we'll end it here again. Get him on Twitter, at MikeRoach247. Mike will humor you with your uh, – your recruiting questions on Twitter. No question is a dumb question unless Mike openly calls it out as a dumb question. And Mike, how are you handling the Ohio State trolls these days, man? They're they are after you in full force, man. Just blocking them. I've, I've used the block button very liberally over the last couple of days. I just I'm I'm not against like having a discussion with somebody, even having an argument with somebody. But if it's just blatant trolling, I don't. I got enough stuff. I got a mortgage. I got a lot of stuff going on in my life. I don't need that. <laughs> I've got a mortgage. I don't need, uh, you know, Jim in Columbus, you know, telling me I suck at my job and I need to quit. So that's a good, good policy to have. All right, Mike. Well, uh, as I said, get him on Twitter at Mike Rose 247, the Horns 247 Twitter account at Horns 247. Don't forget to uh, like, follow, leave a review for uh, Longhorn Blitz, and uh, we would greatly appreciate that. That's what keeps it going. Uh, Mike, thanks, man. We'll do it again next week. All right. Thanks, Jeff. Appreciate it. All right. Big thanks to Mike. Big thanks to uh, Travis, the best damn videographer in the podcast game for doing it up. Uh, And thanks to everybody for downloading and listening again. Thank you so much for subscribing, leaving us reviews, likes, all that stuff. Thank you so much, however you get the show. Matt, thanks for everything, man. You're more than welcome. Rod B., appreciate the time and the knowledge. Anytime, brother. Anytime. For Matt, for Rod, for everybody at the Austin Radio Network and the Horn, 104.9, 101.9, AM 1260, streaming on the Horn app and at hornfm.com where you can get Rod B on the Rodcast each and every weekday from 1 to 3. Shameless plug. You can get this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Stitcher, anywhere you get your podcasts. And thanks to Matt, you can get our archives, classic interviews, classic shows on the Longhorn Blitz SoundCloud page. Yep, just type in Longhorn Blitz. For the Horn family, for the Horns 24-7 family, I am Jeff Howe. Thank you so much for downloading and listening, and we will catch you again on the next episode. You've been listening to Longhorn Blitz with Horns247.com. Remember, for the latest Longhorn news 24-7, visit Horns247.com.